to Malta's long and glorious history, another page was recently added with the presentation to the island of the George Cross. Following an address by the Governor of Malta, the Chief Justice carried forward the box containing the coveted decoration and the letter from His Majesty King George. This is the actual George Cross awarded by King George VI himself to the island of Malta in 1942. The award was created in 1940 to recognise the bravery of civilians or military personnel not directly involved in enemy fire during the Second World War. It is of course traditionally awarded to individuals, but Malta became the first Commonwealth country to receive it as a whole. And that's because of the incredible bravery and stoicism of the people of this island who faced consistent bombing for two and a half years, known as the Siege of Malta. Today, the capital city of Valletta is a bustling tourist destination. It's hard to imagine that back during the Second World War, this peaceful little island was caught in the crosshairs of the battle for the Mediterranean. It was Malta's strategic position which made it so crucial. Nestled between Mussolini's Axis forces in Italy to her north and Rommel's German campaign in North Africa to her south, if the Allies could hold on to Malta and control these waters, they could affect both campaigns. From June 1940 to November 1942, the island became the most bombed place on Earth. Whilst London faced 57 days of continuous bombing during the Blitz, Malta faced 154. 15,000 tonnes of explosives were dropped by German and Italian bombers on an area the same size as the Isle of Wight. 1,500 civilians were killed. As in London, protection for the local population came underground. And several of the tunnels are preserved today in the Malta at War Museum. This labyrinth of tunnels and chambers is the very same which provided shelter to hundreds of Maltese civilians when the dreaded air raid sirens began to ring out. They often would have stayed down here for long periods of time. In fact, the longest raid on the island lasted 13 hours. Maltese grandmother Vicky Rylance travelled the world after marrying a British serviceman. But as a child, she was here in Malta and remembers only too clearly what life was like crawling amongst the rubble left by raids. To a five-year-old, six-year-old, they're just, as I'm walking, two mountains of, two mountains of the stone, stone, with pictures hanging and perhaps a carpet or a... So, so I was looking up in not, in, not in fear, I just didn't know then, you know, just awe, I suppose. And that's what it was like. Vicky was just five years old when the war first came here in 1940 and spent many of her younger years in air raid shelters. When the siren came at the night, each, each adult used to grab a child and rush down. And the whole area was in complete darkness because of blackout and the enemies throw flares to find their targets and I used to be very, very scared of that, terrified. And then, if I weren't quick enough, you could see um, fingers of light in the sky crisscrossing and searching for, this, for the enemy airplane. By then, you know, we would rush down. Protecting the island during those daily raids were British troops, but also thousands of Maltese. This memorial pays tribute to the men of the Royal Malta Artillery who served during the Second World War. They were part of the British Armed Forces, serving side by side with their Commonwealth colleagues. 
They supported the RAF with their anti-aircraft batteries, and those gun defences were to prove crucial during the siege of Malta. But sadly, many paid the ultimate price. This is uh, my regiment again, the same as you, and that's me. I don't know what it is. 94-year-old Major Maurice Aduce is a survivor. During the war, he was a platoon commander at a gun post with the 2nd Regiment Royal Malta Artillery. The gunners would fire up to 13,000 rounds a day. Every day, all day. Uh, sometimes morning, noon and night. Uh, because the Germans, what they did do was they tried to sort of make it uh, very difficult for us to sleep. We had four guns, we had some ammunition, we had men. The planes used to come along, we used to go uh, aim at them and fire. And uh, that was that. Sometimes it was very uh, easy, sometimes it was very rough. April 1942 one of the heaviest months of bombing by German and Italian forces, brought a close shave for the young platoon commander when an unexploded bomb ripped through his room. The bomb came through the... made a hole in the corrugated iron roof. It went down on my bed and I had put my trousers neatly so that they would... Uh, uh, the, the, the crease would, would stay put. It went through my, the top part of my trousers and made a hole that size. It hit the, the springs of the gun, of the bed, and the, the spring pushed it back again against the wall and it slid down and rested against, on top of my boots. The constant bombings were designed to pound Malta into submission. Attempts to run the blockade and resupply the island proved to be costly and often ended in failure. Convoys were hounded throughout their journey. Many ships were sunk. The island was said to only have enough fuel for a few more days of flying. August 1942, this beautiful island is in ruins, having been bombed for the last two years. The Grand Harbour here in Valletta has been constantly attacked. Fuel is low and food is scarce. Malta is on the brink of surrender. Their only remaining hope is a convoy of 80 ships heading this way on a mission known as Operation Pedestal. Their five-day route took them dangerously close to the Italian fleet, past bombers, mines and U-boats. At the centre of it all, the SS Ohio, a tanker carrying 11,000 tonnes of precious fuel. Alongside her were 13 heavily loaded merchant ships, also bringing food and supplies. To protect them, the Royal Navy assembled a massive fleet. 23,000 men, four aircraft carriers, two battleships, seven cruisers and 32 destroyers. During their journey, they faced constant danger. Several of the convoy were sunk and many, including the 30,000 tonne SS Ohio, were hit. To save her, the Royal Navy had to improvise. Two destroyers propped the Ohio up and slowly supported her precious cargo into Malta on the 15th of August, 1942. Wreaths are laid at the memorial overlooking the ocean, including one by retired Colonel Albert Camilleri, a Maltese veteran who was just a child when the SS Ohio and her convoy limped into the city. I remember, you know, that we were not going to suffer. People were clapping and, you know, enjoy, enjoying the day because they said, oh, we might have food from now on, you know, we might have food. You know, that was the, the only thing. We had no food at all, you know. Admission, admittingly, we have the ration card, but, but a week's ration wouldn't last you for, for half a day, so, you know, I remember. 
Operation Pedestal was a daring mission that cost several ships and hundreds of lives. It was to turn the tide for Malta and the Allied troops they served alongside, boosting morale for the civilian population. But behind the scenes, forces on the island were also developing a technical edge. Malta in 1942. This little island has become one of the most bombed places on Earth, the centre of the Second World War struggle for the Mediterranean and North Africa. British and Maltese forces desperately need to find an end to the German and Italian bombardment. The answer came through technology and a change in tactics, becoming offensive rather than defensive. At Dingley Cliffs on the western side of the island, Malta was honing its early warning radar system. Down there on the cliffs below me is an original Amos 504 radar site. It was built in 1942 and it was the first with a rotating antenna. It was used to monitor low-level flying and the surface activity of ships during the Second World War, and in particular during the Siege of Malta. And it was the advances in radar technology that happened here on this island during that time which were to prove so crucial. I've been given special access to Malta's radar site, a place few civilians ever see. Major Tony Abella is a former member of the Armed Forces of Malta and an ex-chief of air traffic. For years, he's been researching the role of radar here, underground during the war. When they came to, to take the equipment out, they had to remove part of the rock here. They used pulleys to bring the generators from the engine room there, which we'll come back to it later on. because the equipment, even the radar at that time, it was heavy, not the today's digital equipment. It was weighing tons. It's, it was a massive piece of metal. And this was the equipment room. You can see everything here except the lighting is all original. Even the, the, the tires are original. And you can see the cable which used to go to Lascaris. You can see the, this case is still immaculate. The, 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 the screws are more or less polished, not corroded. Of course, there is a good ventilation, and uh, there were also the hatch for the aerials. The cables you see is the cables which later was connected to the Admiralty Powerhouse after the war, because it was used as a substation for the Dingley transmitting receiving station, which was operated by the RAF. Now we will be going into the generator room, which is uh, quite interesting. There is a, an interesting story about it. They had two 20 kV Lister, Lister diesels. Originally they had petrol, which they used to give them problems. And then when they came downstairs, they brought the Lister. And they were the cooling fans. And here was the exhaust pipes. You can look at the pipe there for the exhaust which goes in a small tunnel to the caves. Now, the farmers used to live in the caves down there. So they used to see the smoke coming out and they used to say, okay, we are starving and the British are always cooking potatoes and pork and beef. Look at the smoke. They didn't realize it was from the generator. They thought it was coming from the gully, from the kitchen. Radar has often been cited as one of the most fundamental inventions of the 20th century one which won the war. In Malta, it meant fighters could go on the attack, disrupting the Axis campaign for North Africa. I also played a big, big part, especially the radar at Dingley and this site, for uh, cutting the lines for Rommel in the North Africa, because the supply from Brindisi going to Africa um, uh, was being detected from the convoys and we used to direct the aircraft from here, the submarines, and that was uh, what rendered the North African campaign which had to be abandoned by Rome. If it wasn't that, uh, the whole story could have been completely different. It was in Valletta, in tunnels deep under Fort Lascaris, that information from radar was collected 
and air defence missions coordinated. The Lascaris war rooms were top secret and 400 feet below the upper Baraka gardens. In the Sector 8 operations room, all enemy movements were recorded and mapped out by plotters. Sicily, controlled by Axis powers, posed the closest threat. OK, Francis, I, I got you the book, which I written about the raiders. And Francis Kane is one of the few people still alive who worked as a plotter during those times. It was work she enjoyed, but which also gave her a hidden glimpse into the threat the island was facing. There was something about it, something that not everybody's doing. And I know I'm doing something to help the island, a small island, and the, the, uh, the planes were coming right there from Germany. It's not strange from Germany, but not that. Italy has land, gave them a part of the airdrome. So the Germans were landing there. So the next raid is from Italy to Malta. Not such a long way like they used to have. See? And that's very, I mean, for me, knowing what's going on. Like, the, like my mother, the rest of the people down this, the shelters didn't know what's going on. But I knew all the line that we're in danger. In Lascaris, Decisions were taken which really led to the winning of the battle for Malta. The arrival of Air Vice Marshal Sir Keith Park in June 1942 was a turning point. The strategy of tackling the enemy raids um, uh, had completely changed. Who was the man who really changed the, the defence plan into what was called the forward defence plan, which meant that the enemy would be attacked on its way to the island, whereas before um, uh, the enemy was waited to reach the island and be fought on land. Within about, I would say, what, 15 days, probably even less, you know, the tide of war had changed. Spitfire ace Alan Scott was one of the pilots involved in Park's game-changing plans, flying with 603 Squadron. Now, aged 94, he still has his original logbook from 1942, which details just how hectic flying was during the siege of Malta. When you're in uh, Malta, they, you, there's hordes of aircraft coming in. Now, it's quite different from the Battle of Britain, because the Battle of Britain, yeah, they had the whole of the coast, they had all the aerodromes, they had London, they had all the things like that. But Malta, they only had a, a, an island the size of the Isle of Wight. Mm -hmm. So, of course, with just one target, they bombed it and bombed it, and it's the most bombed place on Earth, mm -hmm. actually. So we were scrambled every time a raid was coming in and to try and get above them. Uh, so we climbed absolutely flat out uh, and usually got above the bombers, but never ever did we get above the fighters, their escorts, because they had time from Sicily to get their heights, you see. So we always had those coming down at you as you were attacking the bombers. Mm. But that was what you had to do. Yeah. So our plan was to hit, go for the bombers, and then hope that by the time the measures was coming down, you could turn into them and then a dog fight. The pilots would be scrambled four times a day or more to take on the German and Italian forces. And for five confirmed enemy kills, Allen received the Distinguished Flying Medal. But it was a harrowing time. You, you got callous, you had to be, otherwise you'd never fly again. So when you came back, I mean, it wasn't, uh, you didn't mourn a, a, a fellow pilot that had been shot down. You didn't know, oh, crikey, you hadn't got time to be. You just, it was rather callous, I know, but it was just a livelihood. You sort of say, oh, Robbie got the chop. And, and that was it. Uh, uh, um, that was life there. Horrible, I know, but uh, existence and to get airborne again, you had to keep your nerve and not worry about being shot down. All right, we were all in the way. We, our lives were, as a fighter pilot was worth about 15 minutes, but uh, that was life, and we just had to accept that. The next day brought the convoy within range of Axis dive bombers and torpedo planes. And that day was one of ceaseless action. 
But it was the work of the Spitfire pilots, the Navy crews, gunners and the convoys which turned the tide. On the offensive and able to invade Sicily, the Allies also worked to cut off supplies for the Germans in North Africa. These supplies will keep them fighting back against the Axis until the next convoy succeeds in running the gauntlet, as it inevitably will, so long as we have men like these to keep the ships afloat. It was a decisive moment in the war, the end of the Siege of Malta. Today, the friendship between the British and the Maltese is still celebrated. A recent joint gun salute by the Royal Artillery and the Armed Forces of Malta helped mark 300 years of artillery firepower. The AFM remains proud of its artillery roots. It's an honour to have them here and to have marched you know, side by side, considering the fact that we defeated one of the most evil enemies the world has ever seen uh, in the Second World War. I mean, they fought side by side here, um, in this location, even. At the entrance to Valletta, Malta's war memorial stands proud. A testament to the bravery of the forces that fought here, inscribed forever in stone, woven into the flag of this country, and etched in silver. The sacrifices of this George Cross Island will never be forgotten. <laughs>